Shabbat Shalom, Hebrews and Shebrews. My name is Noel Joshua Hadley. You can call me Noel Hadley. You can call me Joshua Hadley or just Noel or Joshua. But do not call me Mr. Hadley. That is my father's name. This is the Unexpected Cosmology. And I'm glad you can all be here today. I love seeing so many familiar uh, names and faces come back each and every week. And let's dive right into this. This is um, This was an interesting week for me because uh, for a lot of us we've been hopping excited over here at, at TUC because many of us have been going through the book of the Nazarene and this book is loaded with connect the dots kind of material and here's one passage right here now a few weeks ago I went over the uh, pre-existence it was like a two-part series and in in that presentation I made the comment that I felt like we are on this earth because we transgressed um, at an earlier time before we were born. Now, I confess at that time that I had it was kind of a uh, kind of a gut instinct. I had um, a investigative investigative hunch, if you will. And I don't usually do that. I usually like to base my ideas on you know actual text, things I can read. And the only thing I was able to find at the time was something from Legends of the Jews, where it talked about how we were, you know, how we were almost like these like baby embryonic creatures beforehand. I wasn't really real excited with that, but it's all I had. Well, this is what it says in the book of the Nazarene. Chapter 1543. Now, this is going to be Yahushua talking here, and this is what he says. Or this is what the passage says. Later, the disciples asked Yahushua why he had succeeded when they had failed. And he said, these things are... Oh, and just the story here is that they were trying to cure people, and they weren't able to. And people were laughing at him and mocking him because of that. These things are done through the power of the Ruach HaKadosh, which is the hand of Yahuwah. Men have it according to their capacity to hold it, but before it can come in, evil must be driven out. I do not teach abstinence from evil for some purposeless, purposeless end, but to praise or but to bring men to the recognition of their heritage. Okay, so pay attention to this. And the emphasis here is he wants to bring men to the recognition of their heritage. What is our heritage? All men were once sons of Elohim. But they became bastards of Elohim without heritage. I come to men so they may reinherit and become true sons of Elohim. And that right there said it all to me. Uh, that is a, in my mind, a case closed. And that we are, that we were the sons of Elohim. And this is something that uh, John in this group has talked about quite a bit. Uh, that uh, when you see passages like in Job where it says that the, the, the sons of Elohim be went before the throne, but that's not necessarily talking about the angels. It's talking about a different class of beings, and that was us. We were the sons of Elohim. We we done wrong. We screwed up, and um, we had to uh, prove ourselves. We had to come out down here to uh, retrace our steps, so to speak. I wanted to throw that in. Now, one of the other things, there, I, I'll be talking about this book for weeks because there are so many amazing passages in there. When you come into the Torah movement, you will immediately encounter the calendar people. And there are dozens of different types of calendar people. And I'm not putting that argument down. I, we, we should. We need to find out what the true calendar is and uh, obey it. But the problem is, is that I find... Um, people get really proud and puffed up over it, and they're like, you know, that you know, because they're on the true calendar, and you're, you know, they, they, they prayed to Yah, and He told them, and they are on the true calendar, and that's proof of their salvation because nobody else can see it, right? They're the elites of the elite, right? Well, this is a really interesting passage in the book of the Nazarene. So let me read this right here. It was now for many Passover Eve. Now, keep in mind the context here is that uh, Yahushua already celebrated the Passover. That was the Last Supper, guys. So that's a little awkward. So this is after that, and it's Passover Eve. So they're like two days off at this point. And it says, not all keeping it at the same time. That's interesting. For this was in dispute. You almost get the the idea that if this, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll reserve comment till I'm done. Not all keeping at the same time for this 
Christ was in dispute. Therefore, many who could have spoken for Yahusha, being righteous men, went to make their preparations for the festival. Some thought he would be set free when it was over, but most knew in their hearts he would not be released. This comes from the book of Nazarene 2034. So pay attention here. Followers of Messiah were not on the same feast days as Messiah. Okay? Had they been, then they would have been there to speak on his behalf and help him get free. And they, they weren't. So for a hot minute, Yahushua showed us the way, and he showed us what the true calendar was. Unfortunately, not one of the gospel writers decided to tell us what it was, and I think for a purpose. And then if you read a little bit further on, uh, same chapter, 20, verse 79, we read this. Pontius Pilate said, You are a perverse race, over-concerned with unworldly things, and ensnaring yourselves in your own net of goodness. You cannot even agree on the dates of your own festivals or the nature of your Elohim. Now, if this book is a forgery, I'm telling you right now that some, the, 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 the writer infiltrated a Hebrew roots group on, on the internet and studied these conversations uh, that we are having because nothing has changed between the kind of conversations we have now and 2,000 years ago. I think people have this idea that if we could just go back to Bible times, we'd get it, you know, they would set us straight. We'd get it all figured out. And apparently they were debating this back then. I personally believe that this is all a part of uh, the way Yah instituted this to see if we can, you know, all be thrust together, you know, in this pursuit of being in a covenant with the Most High and uh, not agree. And can we still get along? Can we still worship the Most High and not get along? Um, so just want to throw that out there. That was that was just a like wow moment for me reading that. I had never read that in any other gospel where you have, you know, people not agreeing on the calendar. So that was really fun to read. All right. Let's get straight to this tonight. This is the um, I'll be continuing my presentation that I started a year ago on the on the glorious appearing of Yahushua Hamashiach, but really happened in 70 A.D. Uh, I've given two presentations on this so far, I think, and this is an ever growing document. This is on we're starting on page 93 today. We'll be going through a good 30 pages, and this is called Revelation 9 Locust. The fifth trumpet finally explains. They weren't the Russian Mil Mi-24 helicopter gunships of the Rus Russo-Afghanistani war, complete with Scud missiles and other stinging devices, if that's what you were thinking. At any given moment, I never really know who my audience is, and the Zionist fanboys still show up from time to time. And this is just a kind reminder to everyone, then, that the Book of Revelation was intended for this generation rather than that. Certainly not ours. And I am furthermore convinced that Yohanan's contemporary readers were well aware of that reality. Now, if you're already lost, I grew up in the 1980s. Some of you in my audience grew up in the 60s or the 50s. And any of the baby boomers or even the Generation Xers uh, will remember men like Hal Lindsey. He became incredibly, incredibly popular in Berkeley, of all places, I think it was, in the 1960s. Um, and he had the idea, he, his late great planet Earth was like a New York Times bestseller, worldwide bestseller, huge. And he interpreted Revelation from the standpoint of uh, John was seeing actual real physical things on the Earth. And he didn't know, you know, like way in the future, and he didn't really know how to describe it. So uh, he, what he really saw was Russian helicopters attacking uh, post-1948 Zionist Israel. And uh, he didn't really know what to describe a helicopter, so he said that they were locust uh, with stinging tails. Uh, that's how he would interpret the missiles, the stinging tails, uh, which, okay. Just for a little context there. The problem for us on our end of the mud flood reset is that we don't have all of the facts at our disposal. And by facts, I'm talking about the libraries of the world, books. There is no way that Yucanon wrote a piece like Revelation without being well-read. 
nor was it intended for an illiterate audience. I know we have often been told a different story, but I hope to dispense with some of those illusions with the following so many pages. A proper understanding of Revelation was intended to complement a peripheral vision well beyond the 66 canon. Let's just say I, I have found the Revelation locus in another rarely read text, or what remains of it, and I dare say it explains everything. Though it is true that Yochanan, of course he's John if you don't know who he is, was responding to a heavenly vision, that is not to say the vision was inventing anything new. Heaven was granting visions to others as well. And it's no great leap of logic to deduce that Yochanan's was intended to complement theirs and vice versa. How rare is it? I'm the book I'm referring to. I'm not so certain that anybody else has put the pieces together to date. Maybe someone has. Maybe it's out there on the internet. I haven't read it if it's there. I'm going to walk you through this rather than just dropping it in your lap. And so, first things first. Here is the revelation passage that we're all familiar with. Then the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth, and it was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither tree, but only those men which have not the seal of Elohim in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And when he strikes a man. And in those days shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared into battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were their, their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pits, whose name in the uh, Ivrit's tongue is Abaddon, and in the has his name Apollyon. Revelation 9, 1 through 11. It was a fifth angel who sounded his trumpet. I think he's. I think there's a good chance that each of these trumpeting angels are corresponding with one of heaven's multiply worlds, as Yahuwah's throne is on the seventh floor. With each trumpet, the judgment as well as the cry for repentance becomes more severe. I can't prove that at the moment, but it's certainly worth thinking about. We then, we then see the bottomless pit opened up. Out of that pit, we are introduced once again to the locusts who are told to torment but not kill. Yes, they have already made an appearance elsewhere, and the plan, according to the proposed schedule of my clipboard of fun, is to show you. When I do, you will see that the plot twist this time around involves their command to torment the victim without murdering them. That is some uh, pertinent information right there. Usually, the victim is already dead by the time they lay a stinger upon them. Not so this time. And look at, look at how they're uh, presently described for us. They have faces of men with the teeth of lions and, most peculiar of all, the hair of women. Again, these aren't helicopters. They're spiritual beings. If I had to guess, terrestrial real cloth rather than heavenly ones. How, how often do we... Um, actually, I would take that back. I, if I wish I would edit that out. They are not terrestrial real cloth. They're actually heavenly real cloth. How often do we see uh, divine spirits depicted with the hair of a woman? Once if we're going by Yochanan's account. Twice if we're going by the following. And this is what it says right here. This comes from, uh, just to give you a heads up, the Apocalypse of Zephaniah. How many of you have heard of the Apocalypse of Zephaniah before I raise the hands? And a Ruach took me and brought me up into the fifth heaven. Hmm, there it is. That's the connection. The just pay attention, the, the fifth trumpet, fifth heaven. And I saw angels who are called Adonai, and the diadem was set upon them in the Ruach HaKnesh, 
and the throne of each of them was sevenfold more brilliant than the light of the rising sun. And they were dwelling in the temples of salvation and singing hymn, hymns to the ineffable Elohim. I saw a soul which 5,000 angels punished and guarded. They took it to the east and they brought it to the west. They beat it dot dot dot. They gave it a hundred lashes for each one daily. I was afraid and I cast myself upon my face so that my joints dissolved. The angel helped me. He said unto me, be strong, O one who will triumph, and prevail so that thou wilt triumph over the accuser, and thou wilt come up from Sheol. And after I arose, I said, Who is this whom they are punishing? He said unto me, This is a soul which was found in its lawlessness. And before it attained to repenting, it was visited and taken out of its body. Truly I, uh, Zephaniah, saw these things in my vision. And the angel of Yahuwah went with me. I saw a great broad place, thousands upon thousands surrounded it on its left side, and myriads and myriads on its right side. The form of each one was different. Their hair was loose like that belonging to women. Their teeth were like the teeth of... Dot, dot, dot. Zephaniah begins to describe the teeth of the tormenting angels and compare them to something, but then the text cuts off, and we don't know what happens, I am sad to say. What a tease. At least we tried. Did the tormenting angels have the teeth of, li of a lion is an unresolved question, but the mere fact that their hair was described as a woman should immediately nab your attention. There are other similarities. The scene presumably takes place in the fifth heaven, which lines up nicely with the fifth trumpet of Revelation. I say presumably, but only because there may be a break in the text. Corresponding with the fifth ply, we see as many as 5,000 angels punishing a single soul who was caught in a lawless lifestyle upon his death. You see, the person is already dead in this one. Saying he was found in his lawlessness is the same thing as being a serial transgressor of the Torah. Those are the very sort of people whom these same entities were tormenting in Revelation, by the way, though the Yahudim were still living on the, uh, living on the other go-around. The 5,000 against one scenario in the Apocalypse of Zephaniah plays out very similarly to their proposed origin story. Many have made the Jubilees connection with Revelation 9 in recent years, and I don't blame them. I, too, came to that conclusion in similar years, but the evidence found in Zephaniah suggests otherwise. Still, Yothalim, or Jubilees, is worth rehearsing, especially since some of you haven't the faintest clue what I'm talking about, and I don't want to presume. There was a time in his story when the locust creatures didn't live in the bottomless pit, you see, until, well, I would argue that they don't live in the bottomless pit, but according to this theory, uh, until the precise moment when they did, and here is the supposed account of it. Man, I'm really messing up today. Let me back that up, because I, I wrote that just fine. They do live in the bottomless pit. Uh, I don't believe that they are locked in the bottomless pit. All right, so this comes from Jubilee, Jubilees or Yov Halim, chapter 10. And the context here is that it's, it's immediately preceding the flood, Noah's flood. And in the third week of this jubilee, the unclean devils began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah and to make to err and to destroy them. And the sons of Noah came to Noah, their father, and they told him concerning the devils, which were leading astray and blinding and slaying his son's sons. And he prayed before Yahuwah Elohayu and said, Elohim of the Ruachoth of all flesh, who has shown mercy unto me and has saved me and my sons from the waters of the flood and has not, has not caused me to perish as you did the sons of perdition. For your grace has been great towards me and great has been your mercy to my soul. Let your grace be uh, lift up, up, lifted up upon my sons and let not wicked Ruachoth rule over them lest they should destroy them from the earth. But do you bless me and my sons that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And you know how your watchers, the fathers of these Ruachoth, acted in my day. And as for these Ruachoth which are living, imprison them and hold them uh, in place of condemnation, and let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant, my Elohim. 
For these are malignants and created in order to destroy. And let them not rule over the rule cloth of the living, for you alone can exercise dominion over them. And let them not have power over the sons of the righteous from henceforth and forevermore. And Yahuwah Elohainu bade us to bind all. And the chief of the rule cloth, Mesdima, came and said, Yahuwah, creator, let some of them remain before me and let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him and let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. Uh, Yovelim Jubilees 10, 1 through 9. What have we learned in all of this? Much, I'm sure, but here are a few pointers. The children of the watchers perished in the floodwaters, physically, though not spiritually. The Ruachoth continued on because they were terrestrial rather than heavenly-born ones. We've been over this a lot over the last several weeks. And Yahuwah had not prepared a place for them. They became the demons we so often hear about in other places. But there were far too many demons for any one man to take on when we pause to consider that Noah and his family had not grown beyond two or three generations at this time. The Ruachoth of giants may very well have outnumbered them 5,000 to one. It's why Yahuwah tossed nine out of every ten into the abyss. I know it says place of condemnation, but I think a good case can be made that we're looking at the same location. The other 10% remain to wander upon the earth playing the game of peekaboo as ghosts, squatting in haunted houses or straight up inhabiting pork and possessing people through the consumption of it. The 90% though, those would be the ones whom many suspect are unleashed upon the general public in Revelation. Again, though, I'm not so certain that the locust creatures were the Nephilim of old. For starters, we are never once told that the giants looked like locust hybrids. Why not just tell us they were the children of the Watchers, John? He doesn't make the connection. They're never once called demons. The only association we're given between the demons and stinger creatures is in the abyss, it's the abyss itself. Their place of condemnation, which is... Uh, circumstantial evidence at best. Lots of souls end up there. Also, I haven't finished dropping passages from the Apocalypse of Zephaniah quite yet. They show up again a little later down the road, and this time their job description is given. So once more, visiting the Apocalypse of Zephaniah, this is what we read. From, it looks like from chapter 4. Then I walked with the angel of Yahuwah. I looked before me and I saw a place there. Thousands of thousands and myriads and myriads of angels entered through it. Their faces were like a leopard. Their tusks being outside their mouth like wild boars. Their eyes were mixed with blood. Their hair was loose like the hair of women. And fiery scourges were in their hands. When I saw them, I was afraid. I said unto that angel who walked with me, of what sort are these? He said unto me, These are the servants of all creation who come to the souls of unrighteous men and bring them and leave them in this place. They spend three days going around with them in the air before they bring them and cast them into their eternal punishment. I said, I beseech thee, O Adonai, give them not authority to come to me. The angel said, Fear not. I will not permit them to come to thee because thou art pure before Yahuwah. I will not permit them to come to thee because Yahuwah Almighty sent me unto thee because thou art pure before him. And then he beckoned to them and they withdrew themselves and they ran from me. The Apocalypse of Zephaniah 4, 1 through 10. I wish I had actually put more of that passage in there because it, it was a little creepy. It's like one of these creatures sees him. Uh, he's like on the other side of the spiritual veil in the heavens. And it starts coming up to him to attack him and to start tormenting him. And he like, he freaks out. And so the angel here is like, oh, don't worry. You know, you're, you're clean. He can't hurt you. Um, you know, you're under my authority. Anyways, there they are again. The creatures with the scented hair of a woman. Rather than being de described as having the tail of a scorpion, they're given fiery scourges. And I'm thinking it's simply another variation of the same thing. And so... What is their stated purpose? To meet the Ruachoth of dead souls on the other side of the curtain, 
tormenting them with those stingers of theirs before finally casting them into the abode of eternal punishment. We are told the transfer happens over three consecutive days. Actually, the Ruach of a dead soul is capable of wandering the cosmos for seven days in total before entering the abode of Sheol, but there is an order of events that needs played out, and what has survived this document doesn't even attempt to explain that part. Uh, it might be there, um, but uh, we don't. much of this document is missing. Perhaps I will show you where I'm gathering that information from. It's actually quite detailed and a bit of a distraction from the conversation at hand. I actually end up not showing you that information, but you guys, most of the, the listeners here know that it comes from 2nd Ezra, and it talks about how um, the righteous soul and the unrighteous soul, they both are given seven days. They go before the throne of Yahuwah. They are shown the cosmos. The wicked uh, the, the, or the unrighteous are in torment because they realize they missed out on everything. They have no more time to repent. And then the righteous, they're uh, to be put down to sleep in Sheol, and they're really excited because they get to see the kingdom they're going to inherit. Now, the situation has changed slightly today in that um, I believe that the righteous go straight to paradise. Uh, that's all told in the Gospel and Nicodemus and other places. The immediate takeaway is that the that angelic tormentors were not capable of harming Zephaniah, which I already talked about. Oh, they wanted to, as soon as they laid eyes upon him, fresh meat in the locker. Why couldn't they then? Because he was pure before Yahuwah. The contrast has already been made. The lawless man was playing around on the ant hill, but Zephaniah guarded the commands given to us in the Torah, particularly the Sabbath day. It doesn't say the Sabbath day, you will tell me. It doesn't have to. The vital information has already been relayed to us through your canon. Read it again if need be. The locusts are incapable of hurting anyone with the seal of Yahuwah in their foreheads. Many will argue claiming Jesus is their mark and that lawlessness has nothing to do with it, when the problem you see is that most people read the end of the book and then define what they want it to mean without ever getting around to reading the instruction manual at the very beginning. We were already told what the mark of Yah was at Sinai. And it says so right here. This comes from Shemoth, Shemoth or Exodus, uh, chapter 31. And Yahuwah has spoken to Moshe, saying, Speak also to the children of Asherel, saying, Truly my Sabbath ye shall guard, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am Yahuwah, uh, uh, Meko, uh, that must be a, a something weird happened there, but I don't because I don't think that's supposed to say that. But uh, probably Yahuwah Elohayu. Uh, you shall guard the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to Yahuwah, whosoever does any work in the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Yasharel shall guard the Sabbath, to keep the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign, the same thing as a mark, between me and the children of Yasharel forever. For in six days Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. I don't think Yahuwah Elohim could have instructed the people of his covenant in any clearer black and white terms. He even repeats himself for those who may have dozed off in class and also for the teachers who afterwards dare to claim as an answer on the test, did God really say? The Sabbath is a sign, which is the same thing as a mark. It is a sign between Yahuwah and the people of his covenant forever. The Sabbath is a sign of a relationship between Elohim and his people, serving as a test of loyalty to him for those who want to serve as kingdom priests with him. Anyone who fails to keep it doesn't receive the mark and is therefore put to death and cut off from among his people. That is a spiritual reference, by the way eternal death. 
how in the world does someone read something like that and then expect Yahuwah will be okay with them keeping the Pope's day rather than the heavenly one? It simply baffles the mind, but that is darkness incapable of seeing the light for you. The locusts having their way with living mortals may be a once recorded event in Revelation, but they live on when the rest of us die. I'm not detecting the fear of Yahuwah in nearly every claiming Christian. Are they being serious? There's quite literally an army of uh, effeminate bugs waiting to sting your unclean ass into submission soon as the curtain raises on the apocalypse of your existence. Here is another repeat warning from the prophets just to see who was paying attention. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign, mark, between me and them, that they might know that I am Yahuwah that sanctify them. Ezekiel 20, 12. Let me actually see if I can find, I actually found this, another passage. It's not in the final uh, draft tonight. But, it is, oh, so this comes from the book of the Nazarene. And this is what Yahushua says. This is my set message for the wealthy. Enjoy your ill-gotten goods. Console yourselves with comfort. And buy the fickle goodwill of men. Make merry while you may. Close your eyes to the harshness of reality. For the day will surely come when your body weakens. The pleasures pall. And, your glimp and you glimpse the dark doorway ahead. Be certain that the only welcome you will get on the other side is from Ruakoth of Darkness, who will escort you to a proper place in their dismal abode. Is this, is this what it means to break on through to the other side? I'm thinking those are the same Russian Mel Me 24 helicopter gunships of uh, Yokannon's Revelation. Anyways, I didn't put that in this uh, report here, but um, I was reading, I was like, oh, there they are again. There's the locust. So here's another repeat warning from the prophets just to see who was paying attention. This comes from Ezekiel 2012. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign, a mark between me and them that they might know that I am Yahuwah that sanctify them. And this is how we know Zephi uh, Zephaniah was sanctified and clean. He had guarded the commands, particularly this one. The creatures from the bottomless pit were incapable of doing anything to him. That tells us the revelation event was a judgment on the covenant breakers while they yet lived. We're talking about the very people who claimed descendants from Abraham, yet murdered their bridegroom, the Yahudim. Though we may as well call them by the name of their choosing, the Jews. They were taking a stand against the Romans throughout Yehuda, but Yerushalayim was the epicenter in all this. And so, how many are we dealing with? I'm thinking 5,000 to 1 is a likely number, especially since it is the fifth trumpet which beckoned them and they feasted upon their flesh for five consecutive months. Sex would be inhabiting Yerushalayim. If only they had heeded Yehusha's warning rather than hanging him from a tree. Some have suggested that the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD was the opening up of the abyss. Now, if anyone is confused by this, because I'm going to get commenters under any YouTube video on how uh, the fifth seal hasn't been, uh, the, the fifth seal, the fifth trumpet hasn't been blown yet. Uh, but, you know, Revelation, like we're either in Revelation or is it ha hasn't happened yet. Um, and, uh, just if anybody needs caught up to speed, um, I am of the opinion and the conclusion that Revelation was fulfilled by 70 AD, almost entirely. Uh, the Millennial Kingdom happened thereafter, of course, which is a part of this investigation. So now we're jumping forward to the year 79 AD, nine years into the future, according to the official narrative. And let me repeat this, Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, according to some, was the opening up of the abyss. I ultimately couldn't say either way, but my investigative hunch says the timing seems a decade off. 
the trumpet blasts are uh, counted in an orderly and ascending one, two, three, four fashion for a reason. It would seem ne negligent to have five miss out on the roll call, only to pick up the slack after Yerushalayim was destroyed when Josephus and the other historians documenting that affair weren't paying attention. Regardless, we have all heard about the Mount Vesuvius eruption before without even considering the possibility that Revelation, if not some other portion of scripture, was involved. Oh, you've heard of it. That was the blow your lead of it, which destroyed the Roman cities of Hercule, uh, Herculeum, uh, for, I guess, Hercules, and uh, Oplantis, Stabae, and several other settlements, the most famous of which was Pompeii. I can pronounce that one because we have, you know, we all know Pompeii. Before that could happen, though, there was an order of events which are certainly worth mentioning because its key player does tie in, and as always, there is an educational lesson intended before breaking for my commercial sponsors. Earlier in the same year, we're dealing with 79 AD still, a broom star comet was first seen in the east and then in the north, but then finally disappearing after 20 days. For obvious reasons, I wouldn't have the faintest clue what the comet looked like. But if anybody had a camera and film back then, they're not talking. I offer you a picture of one anyways for illustrative purposes. Comets are certainly something to behold. The one in 79 AD prompted the always clever Vespasian to quip, This hairy star is an omen for the king of the Persians. LOL, I get jokes. Apparently not everyone quite understood it, even if they did nervously laugh along, because he is also recorded as given a more self-explanatory variation, which reads, This is an omen not for me, but for the Parthian king, for he has long hair, whereas I am bald. Get it? You know, you totally laughed that time. Which, you know, it's kind of funny, because there's your women's hair right there, right? According to the, uh, the locusts. After the mausoleum of Augustus opened on its own and the gossip columnists seemed certain that it was a sign intended for the present emperor, Vespasia's lineup of Jungle Cruise jokes continued when stating that it was intended for somebody named Junia Calvina, adding, she is one of his descendants. Insert laugh track. That would be for the, uh, the Parthen Parthian king, one of his descendants. He then came down with a fever and died though Emperor Hadrian, among others, incriminated Titus as the person responsible for poisoning him. He was 69 years old. When at last he was convinced that he was going to die, the man who oversaw the destruction of Yerushalayim is claimed to have said from his deathbed, I am already becoming a god. Another joke in case you were wondering. Supposing the comet is the falling star from Revelation 9, and I know that's what some of you are thinking, you have in the very least your first connection with the death of Vespasian. But then with the eruption of Vesuvius, the darkening of the sun over the Roman world is even more enticing. That's not even the whole of it, though. There were giants. A whole mess of them. Vesuvius was a beehive of angry Ruakov. Huge ones to boot. I'm about to show you what Pliny the Younger has recorded of them. Try not to confuse him with Pliny the Elder, though. I, I actually did originally as I was researching this. The guy who is said to have written the Encyclopedia. Yes, the guy who wrote the Encyclopedia. The Elder happened to be a close friend uh, of Vespasian, but then died in the eruption, supposedly. We are told he set sail towards the ascending smoke, after being sent a letter from a female friend, Rectina, he then formed a rescue party to save Pomponianus, a Roman senator, which he did. It was during the attempt, however, that Pliny died from asphyxiation caused by the toxic gases and was promptly left behind. Though somebody named uh, Suetonius wrote that Pliny approached the shore only from scientific interest, and then asked the slave to kill him to avoid heat from the volcano. Sure, that must be it. I'm not saying Pliny the Elder didn't die in the volcano, but I have the hankering suspicion that he didn't die in the volcano. 
Where is my numbers guy? I'm thinking there is Gematria to be found here. These intel personalities rarely waste a psyop when the opportunity starts knocking. Well, this is what Pliny the Younger, not the Elder, wrote. The numbers of huge men quite surpassing any human stature, such creatures, in fact, as the giants are pictured to have been, appeared now on the mountain, now in the surrounding country, and again in the cities, wandering over the earth day and night, and also flitting through the air. After this, fearful droughts and sudden and violent earthquakes occurred, so that the whole plain round about seethed and the summits leapt into the air. There were frequent rumblings, some of them subterranean, that resembled thunder, and some on the surface that sounded like bellowings. The sea also joined in the roar, and the sky re-echoed it. Then, suddenly, a portentous, a portentous crash was heard, as if the mountains were tumbling in ruins, and first huge stones were hurled aloft, rising as high as the very summits. Then came a great quantity of fire and endless smoke, so that the whole atmosphere was obscured and the sun was entirely, entirely hidden as if eclipsed. Thus day was turned into night and light into darkness. Some thought the giants were rising again in revolt. For at this time also, many of their forms could be discerned in the smoke. And, moreover, a sound as of trumpets was heard, while others believed that the whole universe was being resolved into chaos or fire. Therefore they fled, some from the houses into the streets, others from outside into the houses, now from the sea to land, and now from the land to the sea. For in their excitement they regarded any place where they were not as safer than where they were. While this was going on, an inconceivable quantity of ashes was blown out, which covered both sea and land and filled all the air. It wrought much injury of various kinds, as chance befell, to men and farms and cattle, and in particular, it destroyed all fish and birds. Furthermore, it buried two entire cities, Herculaneum and Pompeii, the latter place while its populace was seated in the theater. Indeed, the amount of dust taken altogether was so great that some of it reached Africa and Syria and Egypt, and it also reached Rome, filling the air overhead and darkening the sun. Man, this, if this isn't starting to sound more like Revelation 9 uh, by the minute. There, too, uh, no little fear was occasioned that lasted for several days, since the people did not know and could not imagine what had happened. But, like those close at hand, believed that the whole world was being turned upside down, that the sun was disappearing into the earth, and that the earth was being lifted to the sky. These ashes now did the Romans no great harm at the time, though later they brought a terrible pestilence upon them. Pliny the Younger, he, uh, whatever, his book, 66, 22, 2 through 23, 5. And so, if I'm understanding Pliny right, a host of witnesses claimed to have seen some very large people stepping out of the mouth of the mountain. But not just in Pompeii, though. At first, their forms could be made out in the smoke, though later they made appearances in the surrounding country and again in the cities, eventually being spotted by untold in individuals across the motionless plain, both during the day and night, flitting through the air as they aimlessly wandered. What are we dealing with here? 12 to 18 footers, 30 to 50 footers, or something more on scale with Enoch, 100 feet and beyond? Pliny doesn't say. He does say that uh, they fit the descriptions of the Titans of old, which sounds pretty big to me. I don't think those are 12 to 18 footers. Here is a painting of the Vesuvius explosion, complete with witnesses standing around, warming their bums by the fire, and I'm not seeing any artist rendition of the giants amongst the adorable choo-choo smoke puffs. They do look really quite adorable if you look at the, the uh, smoke around the uh, volcano. I want to know. Those must be Pliny slaves only a moment or two away from offing him. But now I'm thinking there's a good chance that he was strangled by one of the big guys. Hundreds, if not thousands of years chained up in magma will do that to someone. Make them angry. If only there were more clues given to us in the painting. I know we're supposed to have an electoral, electoral for these things, but I'm going to call it. 
Sounds apocalyptic to me. The people living through that event certainly thought so. It's thus reached Africa and Syria and Egypt, blocking out the sun. The trumpet blast from heaven certainly didn't help appease anyone's suspicions. Not the Revelation 9 event, though. Some of you will protest on the basis that the witnesses accredited them, accredited them to the Titans, and have we not already seen their imprisonment in the abyss in Yophelim, or Jubilees? We have. Where are all the stingers, though? I'm not hearing any reports of locusts with lion's teeth and the free-flowing hair of women in all of this. The Titans may have been released, some of them at least, but identifying terrestrial Ruikoff, or just Ruikoff in general, that I would say heavenly Ruikoff, that's the one thing I need to take back in here. Identifying heavenly Ruikoff as the Revelation 9 creatures is getting our wires crossed. But the trumpet, you tell me, what of the trumpet? Was Revelation the only time in his story when heaven thought it would be a good idea to pronounce a judgment with one? The entire apocalypse of Zephaniah is saturated with trumpets, and not one of them involves the events of Yochanan's apocalypse, from what I've read. I probably should have mentioned that part uh, regarding the trumpets. See, this is why I, I mustn't rush things. So, retracing my steps, and this is what we read. This is from chapter 12 of the apocalypse. And again, the great angel cometh forth with the golden trumpet in his hand, blowing over the earth. They hear it from the place of the sunrise to the place of the sunset, and from the southern regions to the northern regions. And it, again he blows it up unto heaven, and its sound is heard. I could show you several other passages from the same text as well, all dealing with the art of the shofar. And what do we see happening? The blast is heard along the sun's entire Curious, probably apocalyptic. And Yochanan's revelation aren't the reason, even if the locusts make an argument for the sake of arguing. I am simply trying to show you that the judgment events in Revelation are not the end all. There are others like Pompeii or the mud flood, or you can go on and on with the the judgment of this. Telling someone Revelation was intended to show uh, the judgment upon Yehuda in 70 AD is like dropping an egg into the skillet. The layman doesn't know what to do with his indoctrination because he has been told to believe Yochanan was warning people about something that wouldn't happen in their lifetime, much less their great, 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 60 or 70 something great grandson's lifetime. Hopefully I counted that right. But his own. And his mind is scrambled. His story goes on. Scripture indicates an additional 500 years between Yehuda's divorce and the initiation of Yehusha's millennial kingdom. I have already detailed that in my 7,000 year timeline deception saga. But even afterwards, we are confronted with an additional short season bookended with resets. There are still apocalypse scenarios to be had, complete with trumpet blasts infiltrating the material world and the supernatural occurrences resulting from them, not to mention four horsemen. My most frequented question is, what now? What do you mean, what now? What has changed between 70 AD and now, aside from the mountain hung, uh, mountain dung heap of deception? an army of locusts on the other side of the curtain waiting to prod you with their stingers so long as you continue rebelling against that fact. Uh, I wanted to add something here and now I can't think of what it is and that's okay. I, I was like thinking of it as I was, I was reading but uh, let's continue on. So now I wanted to cover 666, the mark of the beast finally explained. Hopefully I will explain it. So if it is not finally explained here, then my apologies. You guys can uh, write me a letter and tell me to change the title. We are on page 109 if you need caught up. The 666 number question crops up frequently around here, especially now that I've committed to the 7080 narrative. People often ask, ask like it's some sort of 
Holy Spirit litmus test. Whether or not I have a direct phone line to God, because they're tapped in, y'all, depends upon my answer. What they're more often than not looking for is a futurist explanation, something which might better conform to the Zionist timeline. Well, sorry to disappoint. The mark which Yochanan wrote about already happened. There, I said it. Are you happy now? Go write your complaint letter about me on social media. No believes the mark already happened and the Trinity just gave me the Holy Spirit shivers. Everybody, he's setting us up to take the mark. Oh, sure, that must be it. Tar and feather the guy who does his own research and comes to a different conclusion apart from the cult mentality. Most people have a shake-and-bake reaction to the notion that Revelation has already happened, often invoking the emotional meltdown of the two options. Telling you the mark has already happened is not the same thing as saying it won't happen again. People get their knickers in a twist when making that assumption because, about me because they're projecting their own deductive reasoning onto my own. It was a physical mark, but more than anything a spiritual one. Spiritual indicates an ongoing reality, whereas physical implies it might happen again or that it already has and is, in all likelihood, currently occurring. I will explain. Without uh, going into details that might get me censored on um, social media and YouTube and other places, so you guys can fill in some of those blanks. The best way to do that, I suppose, is by quoting from the passage. And so here it goes. Giving the mark of the beast, the old college try, in three, two, one. And he made... For them all, the great ones and the small ones, the rich ones and the poor ones, the slaves and the freed ones, a sign on his right hand or on his forehead that no one is able to buy or to sell unless he has a sign on his hand or on his forehead or the name of the animal or the number of his name. Here is wisdom and understanding. Whosoever has insight needs to reckon the number of the animal for it is the number of a man, and the amount is found 660 and 6. The Confidential Councils of Yahuwah, or Hebrew Revelation 13, 16 through 18. The decision to go with the Hebrew text rather than the Greek in this instance was to make a very specific point. I haven't made it yet, but when I do, you'll understand why. Here's a clue, though. I firmly believe Revelation was written in Hebrew. We are often told Yochanan had to write in a coded way so as to avoid Roman censorship. Well, what better way to camouflage it then than in the language of his intended audience? Especially since uh, the Caesars and the, uh, you know, the Roman controllers probably couldn't read Hebrew. It probably didn't become a bestseller until after the events it foretold unraveled in real time and was translated into a multitude of languages, including the Greek one. The gematria wouldn't even make sense in any other language but the Hebrew language. Notice how the Hebrew describes an animal, whereas the Greek claims beast. Take a mental note of that. We've been over the animal beast factor in chapter 13 already. Nero, Vespasian, and Titus, again, they, they are what I call the beast or the animal. Well, here is something that I purposely neglected on the last go-around. The Hebrew spelling of Nero Caesar adds up to 666. The Greek doesn't. Then again, so do his successors. Before 69 AD, both Vespasian and Titus went by the names Titus, Flavius, Vespas uh, ah, Vespasianus, Vespasianus, adding up to 666 all over again. Not a coincidence. A Greek reading audience would have a terrible time figuring that one out, though, and undoubtedly explains much of the confusion amongst futurists today. They're always looking for who adds, you know, what name adds up to 666. They're looking at the wrong gematria. Even further evidence that Nero was the man of the hour can be found in the 616 connection. Ever hear of this one? The liberal scholars love to smear our faces with the alternate gematria, but it's all misdirection. They'll say some of the earliest manuscripts read 616, thereby uh, proving that it was never 666 to begin with. Wrong. 
the 616 number derived from the Latin. The change of di digits can best be explained in that the translators understood full well who Yochanan was mentioning, and also that the revelation judgment upon Yerushalayim had already happened. Nero Caesar doesn't add up to 666 in the Latin. No, Nero Caesar equals 616 in the Latin, another coincidence, I'm sure. I'm not done yet. Far from it. There's more to the 666 number than the name of any one individual. I have already shown you how the beast word is rendered animal in the Hebrew. And, well, here is the Hebrew letter, and you can see it right there. Uh, its English equivalent characters are uh, T-R-Y-W-N. And guess what they equal? Go ahead, I'm being serious. Guess. We're dealing with the Hebrew rather than the Latin, and so they equal 666, naturally. Therefore, the 666 number isn't simply the worship of any one individual. It's also the worship of the animal, the state. Of the various words which might be pulled from the Scrabble hat to describe the Roman Empire, tolerance, I put that in all capital letters there, may be the most accurate of them all. I have heard it characterized that way by more than one historian. If you have ever been around a self-characterized tolerant people, like, uh, say, California, then you have likewise probably observed how they tend to be the most intolerant of the quote-unquote non-tolerant people, a.k.a. those who refuse to jump on board the ever-evolving Intel-sponsored state programs. Are you guys following? It, it, you know, the, the, the liberal agenda, they're very, very tolerant, uh, especially the woke crowd. But if you will not agree to the, what, a hundred different types of sexes out there or, you know, the trans agenda, all that kind of stuff, you know, they are intolerant towards you, right? So there you go. That is the modern day America that we are quickly becoming familiar with in the environment by which the original followers of Messiah were forced to reckon with. Consent is the currency of the animal beast system, and many to most will compromise. Everybody wants to know what the currency of the, the next thing is, and I'm, I tell, I'm telling you guys, it's, it's your consent. That is the currency of the present and probably especially the future, as well as the past. Numbered among the self-declared tolerance of the Roman Empire were the persecuted Christians. And why is that? Rome had a policy of allowing temples so that men of various persuasions might worship their choice Elohim. If the followers of the way were, like, except, were the exception to the rule, it's because they refused to compromise. Now, maybe some did, probably a lot of them did, but we're talking about the ones who refused to compromise, who refused to consent, to give their consent. Like nearly any state-sponsored agenda, the tolerance granted towards its swath of citizens started out simple enough, and they always do, particularly among the normies. The merging of state worship from the spirits encapsulating their perceived freedoms uh, to literal worship of Rome's emperor happened in little time, likely over a single generation, maybe two. At first, Caesar worship was but an idea pushed onto the normies by the controllers, making the axiom uh, Kaiser es Dominus et Deus and an informal one. That is, until it was formalized. What followed is the mandatory part. During Nero's tenure and that of the Flavians, a citizen of Rome was required to publicly claim allegiance to Caesar or Kaiser by burning incense in the honor in his honor and then spouting off the Kaiser is Dominus et Deus line in many marketplaces. Those who complied received a document in their right hand for a mark and allowed them to buy and sell. Nabbing a job was also a part of this. Though many have speculated it may have involved a waxy seal stamped onto the person's hand or forehead in some cases. Freedom. All it took was a dash of incense before a bust of Kaiser, and you were good to go. 
I read one historian claiming the incense and allegiance action is analog an analogous to saluting the flag at a football game. Let that sink in. How many woke light normies attempted to convince themselves that they committed the deed for the common good, being fo food industry workers or maybe uh, healthcare professionals or fill in the blank, whatever else? They apparently had no other choice. None whatsoever. They had a family to feed. Not providing for them would be immoral, you see. There was no way out, and certainly Yahuwah wasn't about to provide one, seeing as how they were clearly trying to solve the salvation riddle for themselves with an attitude such as that one. How many Christians, do you suppose, went through with it and argued it was a grace or a freedom in Christ thing, or that they were simply attempting to be all things to all people, and that God was good with it. Back in Yerushalayim, I suspect there was far more going on with the Mark of the Beast situation than marketplace frolics. It involved a temple and an unidentified idol, which Ezekiel referred to as the idol of jealousy. Seeing as how I don't possibly know which pantheon Elohim it was, we shall go with the siren plastered on the Starbucks logo and call it a day. You know it's a problem when Christmas... Uh, when I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You know it's a problem when Christians and get so uptight about not having a Saturnalia tree on their paper cup so as to keep the Christ in Christmas, but then never once bat an eye at the fertility goddess with a pentagram-studded crown of heaven who's spreading her fish legs for their orgasmic pleasure while they pucker their lips to the hot coffee and blow in the church auditorium of all places. If I had to guess, she's got the Semiramis vibe going for her and looks an awful lot like Ashtoreth, if you ask me, which, you know, a Hebrew pastime, and of course those two goddesses are the same person in my book. Probably a Revelation connection. It's why I'm going with the Starbucks logo and not apologizing for it. About that idol of jealousy, I will immediately be told by the Bible scholars that I have the wrong century and the wrong temple, if the mark of the beast is the topic of the hour, which it is. But it will do you well to see this one through. As I was saying, it derives from Ezekiel, and here is the passage. I'm going to pause for a swig of coffee. Coffee, give me a minute. And it came to pass in the sixth year, the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Yehuda sat before me, that the hand of Adonai Yehuda fell there upon me. And then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins, even downward fire, and from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head and the Ruach lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of Elohim to Yerushalayim, to the door of the inner gate that looks towards the north. So he's in the temple now. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy? Who does it provoke to jealousy? It provokes Yahuwah to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the uh, Elohim of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of Adam, lift up thine eyes now the way towards the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way towards the north, and behold, northward at the gates of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of Adam, see you what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Yashro commits here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn yet again, and you shall see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of Adam, dig now in the wall. And when I had dug in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold, the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, an abominable, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Yasharel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Yasharel, 
And in the midst of them stood Yaazan Yahu, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of Adam, have thou seen what the ancients of the house of Yashrael do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, Yahuwah sees us not. Yahuwah has forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn yet again, and you shall see greater abominations that they do. So that these abominations keep escalating. And then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahuwah's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And then said he unto me, Have you seen this, O son of Adam? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of Yahuwah's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of Yahuwah, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of Yahuwah, and their faces towards the east, and they worshipped the sun towards the east. Then he said unto me, Have you seen this, O son of Adam? Is it a light thing to the house of Yehuda that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, therefore will I also deal in fury, my eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Ezekiel chapter 8, that's the entire chapter. In review, the prophet Ezekiel was minding his own business, as these things often go, when the Ruach of Yahuwah lifted him up in a vision and set him down into the court of the temple in Yerushalayim. It was there that he saw clear as day what is described for us as the image of jealousy. He was then told to enter a door in the wall and observe the hidden artwork lighting the walls, the idols, all of which uh, were idols and depicting abominable animals. Pig? Pig, was it? It's nearly always pig. Oh, I'm sure there's nothing abominable about pig now, if they were to scribble it on the walls of the temple today, that is. But then there are the 70 elders all participating in worship of the those said idols, with their king. Sounds suspiciously like a conspiracy, and everybody who was promoted to a position of authority was participating, conspiring. But I'm sure that couldn't happen today. We are not told the identity of the idol of jealousy, but I'm thinking the women weeping for Tammuz is our first clue. Had you read my Nimrod paper, then you will recall that Tammuz was the son of Semiramis and Nimrod. And more than likely, the priests had already aided and abetted in passing their children through the sacred fire. The men turning their backs to the temple so as to worship the eastern sun provides even clearer evidence that it was Nimrod they were worshipping. Even if the identity of the divine beings went by other names, the big B and uh, his escort, uh, his, his woman, Ashtoreth. You're probably still wondering what any of this has to do with the Mark of the Beast. In full disclosure, I'm attempting to show why the temple was raised to the ground. Ezekiel's vision has much to do with this destruction on the first go-around, but I'm thinking it was a repeated event. Child sacrifice is so enticing among Satan's children, and the elders of Yashril simply couldn't help themselves. It helps that I found another passage which describes the same scene, though the context is different. No, I am not thinking the idol of jealousy was a one-off in history. There were two temples in Yerushalayim, and both experienced the same sad ends. Read it and weep. So this passage comes from the dealing with a lot of apocalypses tonight. This is the Apocalypse of Abraham, and it says... And I saw there the likeness of the, what is it, the idol of jealousy, carved in woodwork such as my father was wont to make. And its body was of glittering bronze, which covered the wood. And before it, I saw a man who was worshipping the idol. And in front of him there was an altar, and upon the altar a boy slain in the presence of the idol. And I said to him, what is this idol on this altar, and who is he who is sacrificed? And what is this great building which I see, beautiful and art in design? 
even with a beauty like that which lies beneath your throne. And he said, Hear, Abraham, for that which you see is the temple, a copy of that which is in the heavens, glorious in its aspect and beauty, even as I shall give it to the sons of men to ordain a priesthood for my glorious name, and in which the prayers of man shall be uttered, and sacrifices offered as I ordain to your people, even those who shall arise out of your generation. But the idol which you saw is the image of jealousy, set up by some of those who shall come forth from your own loins in later days. And the man who sacrifices in murder is he who pollutes my temple. And such are witnesses to the final judgment. And their lot has been set from the beginning of creation. Now, if you remember when I went over the, the, the many lives of Nimrod, I talked about how generally people misrepresented the whole Sam, Semiramis storyline. Uh, they, they used to think that Semiramis went down into Sheol to rescue her son Tammuz after he'd been killed. That is incorrect. The story is actually that has come about with more um, tablets and scrolls that have come up that have been uncovered, released to the public uh, in the last 30 or 40 years has been one which has Sammy Ramis wanting to conquer the underworld. And uh, when she dies in the process, um, she is able to redeem you know, herself um, come out and live again but in order to do so she has to sacrifice someone worthy and uh the only person she finds who is worthy is her son slash husband who is uh seated on the throne gloriously dressed and not weeping for her and seems to be happy that she's gone so she kills him so there's another clue you see the women weeping for tammuz and there is a boy sacrificed on the altar uh representing Tammuz. Um, so I'm guessing that the idol was a woman. That's my guess. My suspicions are confirmed. There was child sacrifice during the Tammuz weeping event. Perhaps Ezekiel did not mention it because he was never taken around around the corner out back to see the rising smoke in the valley of Hinnom. I know Abraham saw a boy slain in the presence of the idol of jealousy, presumably near the inner gate facing to the north. But this may be a very different event than Ezekiel's event. I took the red marker out on the timestamps. Abraham was told it would happen in the later days, which again might be referring to the first temple, but then keep reading. These backstabbers were witnesses to the final judgments, and the first temple was not the final judgment. That's not describing the Babylonian assault. Is this a, is this a third temple being spoken about then? No, it's the second the house of Herod. The final judgment quip will make absolutely no sense whatsoever if one fails to recognize that the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was the final judgment. Yashorel was already divorced from the land, but now it was Rome's turn to hold the earth's hair back while Yehuda got vomited forth. That was it. It was done. Story over. There is a promised land, but Yehuda was no longer it. Once Rome surrender, uh, surrounded Yerushalayim, there was no going to Gehenna during the cover of night. They were stuck in the temple court, and clearly the Torah wasn't their digs. I mean, they were being judged, after all. And seeing how these are the sons of Hasatan we're dealing with, they simply couldn't help themselves. A good old-fashioned city siege is as clear a time as any to lay all one's cards upon the table. See who has the winning hand. Might as well roll out the idol and be open about the child's sacrifice for once in their lifetime. I have more to say on what I suspect was happening in the temple grounds, but there is another text which is first, first worth mentioning. Yehusha asked Yochanan, what did you know about me? The O'Cannon said, Years gone by, I had a vision of three heavenly lights, and the sun sank, so they rose. Or, and as the sun sank, so they rose. A flame of fire went up over Yerushalayim, and smoke filled the temple, and a star fell down into Yehuda. The meaning I know, for it was this. The deliverer is born, and woe unto the house of Herod. Woe to you, scribes, and your interpretations of the Torah. The star that appeared and stood over at Yerushalayim was a child planted into Bethlehem from out of the heavenly heights. 
as was foretold. And it was prophesied he would be the deliverer. The fire that burned was the fire of a strange altar. Uh, Book of the Nazarene 2, 9 through 11. And of course, he's not describing the, uh, the, second, uh, the first temple, is he? There it is. I have just given you two witnesses to the Ezekiel vision, and this one undoubtedly connects the destruction of the second temple with the fire, with the fire ascending from a strange altar, or you might say strange fire or strange worship. Somebody had to have built that thing, and I can't seem to find the blueprint instructions anywhere in the Torah. The star falling down into Yehuda reminds us of the Revelation 9 star, which is given the key to open the abyss. Here the star is identified as Yehusha HaMashiach, rather than the typical Satan or CERN interpretations, and I'm going with this one. It is Yehusha who pulled out the whip on an occasion or two, and Yehusha again, who appeared in the skies over Yerushalayim, raising the temple to the ground. I had neglected to comment upon the observation made by Abraham in his Apocalypse that the carved image was something resembling what his father Terah was wont to make. That again takes us back to Nimrod's kingdom and the worship of sacred fire. The same text has Terah expiring in the flames as a direct consequence to his devotions. Such is the fate of all idols, as well as their worshippers. Meanwhile, in Yerushalayim, it may very well have been a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Christians heeded to Yahushua's warnings and skedaddled, soon as the footsteps of the Roman legions were heard over the horizon, and the temple controllers saw what was coming. In actuality, while crying out to the Elohim of their devotion so as to, to, to divert the lot that had befallen them, they ultimately secured the very judgment they were aiming to avoid. Pride always seems to get in the way of repentance, don't it? I very well might be wrong, but here is what I'm thinking regarding the idol of jealousy. The human sacrifice component was still a secret among the satanic elite when the stage actors had their idols set up. Uh, there there might have been um, a child sacrifice when Yahushua was there. Um, who knows what they were doing behind closed doors. I mean, clearly, Ezekiel was shown a vision where he's like, okay, go behind the wall, um, and you're going to see things back there that the 70 elders are all participating in and nobody else knows about. I mean, clearly Ezekiel didn't. Its positioning along the north gate, this would be the idol of jealousy, entailed that every temple visitor was immediately confronted by it more than likely, and knowing how our sick, sadistic, sociopathic controllers operate, those patrons would have been forced to offer a pinch of incense, perhaps even receive a waxy seal upon their right hand or forehead as proof of their allegiance, or maybe just a document in their hand, before venturing onward. Even if they were explicitly there to worship Yahuwah and no other, compliance is the currency of the order. I've said this many times before. How many people do you suppose went through with it? How many people justified their action because the worst imaginable thought would be excommunication from the temple? And Yah, as we have all so often heard, will be okay with the compromise. Fear such as what I have just described was a real thing. Yochanan recorded one such instance in his Bezora, and this is what we read in John 9, 20-23. Uh, this is the parents of the, the blind man, by the way. Uh, his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we know not. Or who has opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spoke his parents because they feared the Yahudim. For the Yahudim had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Mashiach, Yahusha, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. That's jacked up beyond words that the parents snubbed their blind son due to embarrassment and even more messed up that they would have little or nothing to do with him after Yahusha renewed his eyesight. But that is the cowardice in most people. They wanted to be accepted by their satanic controllers. 
And as you can see, confessing Mashiach would have them put out of the synagogue. Oh, I'm sure they argued being put out of the synagogue would be the worst action because then they would be cut off from Yahuwah altogether, you see? That is what cognitive dissonance does to a person. And so I will ask again, if the Yahudim were cowardly enough to denounce Mashiach so as to keep the doors open and available to them, then what was stopping them from a pinch of incense and a receipt of purchase? Uh, before we move on, I will point out that this, um, this blind man, who then was given eyes to see, the records I have found on him is that uh, he, in uh, 36 or 37 AD, um, he was, uh, as soon as Pontius Pilate left Jerusalem, his, his duty was up. He went, returned back to Rome. Eventually, as you know, he committed suicide, or he was suicided in Switzerland. Um, Yosef of Arimathea was very good friends with Pontius Pilate, and it is because of their friendship, uh, and of course, Yosef of Arimathea was one of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he was one of the good guys. He was one of those who spoke up for Yahusha. Because of that, he was protected. So long as Pontius Pilate was around, Yosef was protected. Well, as soon as he left, uh, Yosef of Arimathea's life was over. Uh, I, he was tossed out of Sanhedrin, if he wasn't already. He had already been thrown in prison before that. Um, and he was thrown onto a boat with uh, Miriam of Migdal, the two of them together, and a few other people, um, Lazarus, or slash Eliezer, and Miriam. Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, Martha, uh, Miriam's sister. And uh, they were... They were they, cast off without any sails, without any oars. They ended up in France. Long story. But uh, all my research that I have compiled shows that in that boat with them was this blind man. So, of course, he could see at that time. So that's kind of a fun little thought. He became good friends with um, Yosef of Arimathea and uh, Miriam of Migdal. The Mark of the Beast lives on, of course. That's the thing that irks me most about this entire conversation. I kid you not, the average Bible reader is so programmed by dispensational thinking that upon hearing that the mark was already passed around to the Kool-Aid drinkers many moons ago, they're like, whoopee, I'm free to take whatever mark I want now. Are you being serious? Unfortunately, some of you are as evidence that the mark is still a force to be reckoned uh, among our slave plantation taskmasters, I offer you a recognizable hand sign. It is called the premium victor or the OK sign by the normies, but most of you know what it really means. If you need this spilled out for you, and by that I mean literally spilled, then no worries. I've got this. The thumb and the pointer finger form the circle part of the six. And then look at what else stands erect, though many okay gestures bend the fingers for, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, though many okay, oh man, I, I think I need more, another drink of coffee. Let me, let me take a quick swig here. Trying this again. And then look what else stands erect, though many okay gestures bend the fingers for a purpose. Three fingers. This will require elementary math, but I'm sure you're up for it. Six pronounced three times is 666. Six, six. There's always that one person in the room who thinks I'm making this stuff up. It's why I've come prepared with pictures. I have plenty to share and am not afraid to use up as much paper as is necessary to demonstrate 666 as a present day reality. Michael Jackson was sold into the MK Ultra program as a boy and likely didn't have the remotest clue what he was doing at the time. The reason I decided to show him first is because it's so obvious his handlers were behind the hand gesture. Have you ever seen a yearbook photo look more unnatural? Oprah, on the other hand, is coming across as a little too ambitious and becoming America's next daytime talk show host. Perhaps I should have said hands because look at her hand, why don't you? And then the other hand, both of them. Ridiculous. How many other women did she bowl over to get in front of the line and beat everyone to the blood contract? Pictures such as this one makes me think she sold her soul before they could even get around to offering her the second helping of fried chicken. Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio must have been ardent readers of the Bible, particularly the last book in the series, and knew precisely where it was at. Because look at their career, why don't you? 
Who said the mark is only good at buying bread at the local boulangerie? Those eyes of Horace salutes sure paid off. Such vogue, too. There are others, but this one is probably the favorite in my collection. President Richard Milhouse, I am not a crook, Nixon, wanted to make sure the three Apollo 11 astronauts were okay. After that long space flight to the moon and back, as you will know, that must be it. Looks like they were okay, according to this picture. Glad the news was there to document that fact, so that we might know everybody was okay long after the fact. Adorable moments in American history. Nothing to see here, I'm sure. Even Ronald Reagan was known to show his Babylonian street creds for the newspapers with the flash of a Nimrodic gang sign from time to time. And from the looks of things, Nancy Reagan wasn't in the know, poor girl. The mark of the beast is a hand signal, but as I've already explained, it's much more than any one thing. A mark is a sign, indicating the allegiance of one's ruach. Everybody telling you it's some technological implant when you're removed from the present, and as always, seemingly a year or two away, are either haphazardly ill-informed or purposely planting breadcrumbs in the wrong direction so as to keep you detached from the reality of your own spiritual allegiances this very hour today. No, I am not saying to go get chipped. Don't be ridiculous. Don't misquote me. The mark was here long ago, and it continues to the present day for anybody who wants to make a few extra bucks. Read the mark's description again. That no one is able to buy or to sell unless he has this sign on his hand or on his forehead or the name of the animal or the number of his name. There are multiple qualifications rather than one, none of which are exclusively dependent upon the other. Count them up with me. Is it either a sign on the hand, it, or I'm sorry, it, it is either a sign on the hand or on the forehead or the name of the animal or the number of his name? How many did you count? I'm seeing four listed. The mark can be any one of those things and not necessarily the other and not necessarily all of them. Telling us there were various forms of it in the first century, both on the physical and spiritual level. Why must the mark end then? Satan is only here to lie, steal, murder, and destroy. What better way to do that than telling you it hasn't happened yet? Or that it already happened to another generation and the test is over with? Or dailing one option as a distraction only to plow you over with any one of the other three? All right, so that's it tonight for that presentation. Thank you all for listening in. I could have gone much more on the the six 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 situation. I think that um I think that it's been kind of well grounded there. Especially, I should have revisited the Sabbath, but you know the the Sabbath is the big one, right? Everyone is you go to all these truther sites, and you know like. They'd love to talk about the mark of the beast and don't take the mark of the beast. And nobody is really asking, do you have the mark of Yah? Like, you know, I mean, lots of people can, you know, I guess not take a pop a pill or whatever they claim it's going to be, uh, you know, Neuralink, whatever. But uh, do you have the mark of Yah? That's what we all need to ask. Because if you don't have the mark of Yah, you've got some, uh, some locust creatures, you know, when that curtain uh, goes up. Uh, parts of ways you and you see the other side of the the the, uh, the spiritual plane. You've got some, some nasty little uh, serpent creatures, bugs, or locust creatures over there wanting to sting you into submission. So, hope you guys all enjoyed that and handing it to you guys for a few minutes before we hand it over to Michael to continue the discussion with the Aramaic Targum. Does anybody have any thoughts? To know the um, book of the Nazarene, uh, where where does where did this book come from, and um, what year did it show up in? Do you know? Yeah, so the the if you do a search on book of the Nazarene, you're not going to really find much on it. It's uh, tip. It's more commonly known as the Gospel of Kaleidi, um, which you're not going to find much on that either. And one of the reasons I highly suspect that hardly anybody has ever read the Gospel of Kaleidi is because it's called the Gospel. 
gospel of Kaleidi. I mean, I don't... I, hopefully this isn't offending one, but that's pretty much a lame title. I mean, that doesn't sound very biblical. It sounds, you know, Irish, right? Well, um, there's <clears throat> some interesting documents that came through England. And, of course, England really has my interest. And uh, so the, the you'll see the Gospel of Kaleidi um, kind of connected with the Colburn Bible. And the Colburn Bible is a weird, strange mix. It has its own New and Old Testament, just like a 66 canon. And the the first half, which would be the what we would call the Old Testament section, uh, is like these. It was it was apparently written in Egypt right around the time of the Exodus. And I've gone over some of that, you know, talking about some of that stuff. And then the later portions is very British centric, and it talks about the father of their faith. Uh, the father of their faith was Joseph uh, or Joseph of Arimathea, and he comes over with. Um, um, what's his name? Aristolus. If I'm, uh, that would be, um, I'm pronouncing that wrong at the moment, but that is Kepha's brother-in-law as well as Philip came over, uh, Miriam Migdal came over and of course Paul came over, but he doesn't seem to be real influential in this literature. Uh, but, uh, Joseph of Arimathea was. And so, uh, the book of the not serene, here's, here's what I think. If I were to pinpoint anybody who wrote it, um, it I, I think it was, um, it may have been Joseph of Arimathea, but I actually think it was uh, Peter's father-in-law. Um, here, and here's why. Um, he, um, he was very close, Peter's father-in-law was very closely connected with Joseph of Arimathea because they did travel to England together. They would have been sitting around in, uh, in a hut in Glastonbury, uh, you know, not with not much to do on some days. They had a lot of time to talk. But uh, the book is heavily focused on John the Baptist. So we know that the the writer was a disciple of John the Baptist. Well, Peter and Andrew were disciples of John the Baptist. We also know that this book, um, it, it, it had to be in someone from Peter's household who highly influenced it because it is... Um, it... it it had a lot of intimate details about the goings on of Peter's household in Galilee. And so again, I think it was his father-in-law that wrote it who uh, he is mentioned in Paul's letter to the Romans. And when Paul wrote that letter, he was not there. He was gone. We don't know where he, well, it, it doesn't say where he was in Romans, uh, but we know he was in England at the time. So uh, that's, that's my synopsis of the book. It is not a perfect book by any means. It, it does have, I believe, some errors to it. Um, many of these extra biblical books, when we look at them, they, they do. I mean, they're written by men, um, and they have some error. Um, and um, what I love about the Book of the Nazarene, or Gospel of Clyde, whatever you want to call it, is that it is highly Torah-focused. And Yahusha is just talking about the Torah, the Torah, the Torah, all throughout it's really incredible. Uh, we've been, uh, Rebecca started out saying uh, at the beginning of this discussion that she was kind of a little lost this last week going on because it's just been a fire chat on here. We've just, there's been several of us really excited uh, reading from this book, which I will be reading from this Thursday live. If you guys come by, uh, I think it'll be like a three weeks to get through it. We're just going to read through about seven chapters a night and then discuss it. So please all come by. Hopefully that answered your question. I had another thought on um, like Ezekiel, you know, looking through the wall and the 70 elders in that. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that it's too different than we see today, even with a lot of like people, you know, would say Torah observant that you kind of find out later on or you kind of get to know somebody to find out they're really not truly walking the way they say that they walk or, or you find out, you know, people that you, you would think that you would respect and then find out behind closed doors that they're doing things that they shouldn't. And it always reminds me of the scripture, you know, that they say they honor me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. And, um, you know, you were talking about in the text about, you know, child sacrifice and these things. And I, I think that I find that happens today, we, even with, you know, people, men and women in our culture that, we you know, having like porn addictions or that these, you know, Torah observant men, you know, looking at all of these things, because I think to me, that's a modern day sacrifice of all the things that are kind of going on behind closed doors. 
that, you know, these men that are in these, you know, porn pictures or videos, like they're really victims of human trafficking or like child sacrificing and that where they would take these children and they, you know, abuse them violently in these uh, areas. Then they grow up and they prostitute themselves into these areas of, um, you know, pictures and pornography and porn movies and stuff. They pay them really high in, in, in that. And uh, I think it's really important that why we should be confessing or finding somebody that you trust to confess your sins in these ways. Because I think that lots of people are kind of contributing to these modern day um, things that we have. And I think it's for all of us that we all need to be taking an account and really trying to walk uprightly, uprightly and righteously in Yahuwah because it's important. And Yah does see everything that we do and that we say. It says that we have to take an account for every idle word that we speak. And that, you know, is even in our anger when we speak to people out of anger or you spoke earlier about, you know, loving people. It, it really truly is about loving. Like, y'all is love, and we walk in that. And even if someone is struggling with pornography or things like, you know, we should be in a situation where our brothers and sisters could come to us and uh, we don't stand in judgment and we try to help these people and to say, I'm going to pray for you. I want to hold you accountable and I'm going to check in with you and I'm going to ask you all the time, how are you doing? And that's not just for that. It's to say everybody has their own kind of sins in their life. And I think that, um, you know, we go through all these censoring on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and that, you know, but they don't, they can't seem to, to censor child pornography or um, you know, pornography in that for it to, that is really affecting our society and all of our young men. And today we didn't have that growing up. I mean, all this stuff was kind of behind walls and sheets in stores where it's really prevalent in our society. And so I just wanted to kind of put that out there that I think that that's kind of like a modern day a sacrifice that we're seeing in children today. And I just really hope that we can all continue to pray for one another and hold one another accountable in our walks and to love one another in these areas. Thank you. That was really good. Someone else was going to say something and I didn't see who it was. It, it was, was me. me. I was just... no. but, uh... Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, Noel, um, if uh, you can explain to me what a spiritual sacrifice is. Um, as opposed to, I guess that's a church term. I'm not sure. What, what context? What, it's spiritual. Oh, yeah, scripture is scriptural context um, that we are to make spiritual sacrifices to, to God or to Yahweh. Okay, that's a good question. And instead of me... Um, Jumping out there and answering that, I would want to, um, I guess, really get the context of the the scripture um, because I I would probably answer it and not really answer your question. I think um, it, it was in the context of praise and spiritual sacrifices. It was, uh, uh, I think it's um, Paul actually, uh, or maybe it's John. Those are the only two I read, and Peter. You know. But, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about the Book of the Nazarene was that one of the overlaying themes of that is sacrifice. And um, Yahusha, he he defines sacrifice in there. Um, and again, I would need it right in front of me to get this right. But he he the the best example that is given in the Gospels of what I'm about to describe is when Yahusha is in the temple and he. He looks at the people, the, the rich people dropping in the coins, making a lot of noise. And then he watches this like widow, you know, she's got like two of the, the, the what are they, like the, the, the cheap, like the pennies of the day. You know, she drops two of them in. Right. And in the, in the, in the book, the Nazarene, he looks at his disciples and said, she's, she's going to go hungry tonight. She's not going to eat a meal because that was her food. She just gave. And. Uh, he said, he says all throughout the gospel, he says that uh, people think they're sacrificing to Yahuwah and they're not. Um, he said sacrifice is actually uh, literally like you are given, giving to the point where you are suffering as a result. It's not like, okay, I'm making all this money. Here's my 10%. I'm tithing. Okay, now I'm just going to, you know, it's like uh, literally like you give a shirt off your back 
to somebody and it's like you're out of shirt. You know, you're um, you're you're walking out of um, a, a food a place with your dinner. I mean, you're taking it home and you see a homeless guy there and you you you're not like, oh, here's a couple bucks. It's like, oh, here's my dinner. And now you don't have dinner. Like, that's what he talks like that in that book right there. That is what sacrifice is. Now, we can look at other passages in scripture and, and see, but um, I'm trying to like show that like I, I've really come to that awareness recently of, you know, how much of am, am I really sacrificing? Right. Um, so one of the things that he was uh, he said he was sick of is, you know, he was sick and tired of just like the, the sacrifices people were bringing them because they were just they were just checking it off of a box. Um one of the things that Yahusha says in the in the book of the Nasrim, he said, I'm so sick of people. They just go to the synagogue for an hour on Sabbath. He actually says that. And it's not just like church today. It's like they go to they go there for an hour, they worship, and they go home and they forget everything. They just live their lives. He said, That's not sacrifice. So, um, so the guy who sees his reflection in the mirror and goes away yeah. and doesn't remember who he is. What are we looking at? Oh. So um my wife just Gave me this uh, book here. I'm trying. To, okay, okay. So here's a here's a reading from the book on when he talks about sacrifice. Let me. She pointed her finger to a pass. I'm reading from the actual book. Let's see if I get this right. Uh, for when. Um, oh, okay. So this is this is kind of a sad story. Yahusha is actually telling the story um, about when he was a boy and his mother Miriam. Uh, love to feed the poor. And so he said, when I was a boy, the poor would gather about my mother's door, for she always had an extra loaf in the oven for them. One day a beggar, having been fed, often now perhaps considering it his entitlement, and this is the one of the big things, because they're like, people are always like, yeah, but all the poor people are entitled. And Yahushua's like, so what? So what if they're entitled? That's not your concern. Um, anyway, says entitled man found it to found it fit to scold her, Miriam. For this day she was not well; she was sick, and therefore slow. She not being used to this began to weep. So she starts; she's crying. Okay, and he tells a story. Now jumping ahead, he says, "For when my mother cried, I said to her, dry your eyes and be happy. For now you can perform your charitable acts to perfection. Had those who stood about the door praised you, the deed would have been less worthy." Having been done for the for their praise and therefore not entirely out of charity, many do good works because it increases their self esteem. But charity is not giving to the bone to a hungry dog, but giving the meat when hungry yourself. And that that really struck me when I first read that. It's like ooh, because it's like we all think about like you know feeding the leftovers. Right? I've got these leftovers. I feel so much better now. I gave those away. It's like no, you give. You take the crumbs and you give that. That I think to I think to Yahuwah, uh, that is what sacrifices. So, um, did that answer your question, or maybe you're thinking of something else? Oh no, uh, no, you totally. Uh, well, I was thinking of something else, which was the spiritual sacrifices are, um, you, uh, you know, making you know like uh, sacrificing that thing you really want to do that you know you shouldn't do, <laughs> like a sin. You know, like, I mean, I know it's that, how is that worth anything to God? It's really more like just don't sin. But I mean, that's the first thought that pops into my mind is that, well, the best I can do is to make a spiritual sacrifice is to just be moral, you know, and sacrifice my animal instincts. You know what I mean? Just a couple of things. I really liked how you tied in the mark of the beast and what that was. And it's really um the names of course but consent equals compromise and uh we see so much of that today what's going on and uh so that hit me pretty good and another thing was in ezekiel when you were reading about that um about all the abominations and you know, go and look, and he look at what they're doing now, and and I've actually experienced that in this messianic movement of um, people turning to the east to pray, um, and I've actually stood to the west. I will turn opposite, just because of this line, and I 
they do bring up Daniel and how he prayed to the east. But in my mind, I'm like, he's not going to see me facing the east. There's no, there's no compromise. There's no question in my mind of who I want to worship. And it's only him. So um, see, if I were in that room, I would pull out like a flat earth map or a moon map. And I would figure out where I was on there, and I would and I would figure out the show where they're facing east, and go like, tech, you guys are kind of like pointing in like a southern direction. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I would, I don't know. I probably could, you know, whatever. I don't think I'd last in that discussion. But yeah, I'm sorry that. Um, yeah. So, what? Why? Why were they? What was the motivation for them to pray to the east other than Daniel? Was it, I mean, were they facing Jerusalem? What were they doing? Yeah, that's what they want to do is face Jerusalem to pray, to bless it. Yeah. Pray for Jesus. Yeah, and I would imagine that they would be, um, you know, it, anybody doing that would probably be a futurist of Revelation, uh, that it hasn't happened yet. And even though that the funny thing is, is that even from the futurist perspective, um, you would think that reading Revelation, it's like Jerusalem is going to be completely destroyed and Yahuwah is still like punishing, uh, punishing them. But I don't know. Well, that's that's crazy. It's out there. It happens. And another exciting thing this week, I saw a little clock for sale in a thrift store and it was the flat earth with an airplane going around in a circle as the second hand. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't pass that up, right? It was a little broken, so I didn't get it. But yes, I took a picture of it and okay. I'll post it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, man, I wonder if there's someone out there who could fix that clock. That sounds like an awesome clock. Okay, does anybody else have... Does anyone else have any thoughts, comments, questions over tonight? I was going to say, too, that uh, what I didn't talk about, and it's one of those things, if I had more time, and I might go back and do it, I would talk about it, is some of the reports that have come out of the Vatican and uh, even Buckingham Palace, uh, the Vatican particularly, that there are these child sacrifices that go on there where um they they will there will be a priest uh presiding over it but it it's always in the, the 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 few people that have apparently come out and talked about this it was where like they're just the people that are being brought to the next level like okay you you want to commit to the cause you know you want to have your uh your fame your success fill in the blank you're going to come down here and take part in this child sacrifice and they would roll in a real child and do it um and um that kind of it reminded me of that with the temple uh because you know this is the reason being i say that is because there could have been child sacrifice all over israel but the the idol of jealousy isn't just like a you know an idol down at the marketplace this is in the house of yahuwah that is it it incite his jealousy remember what these people said down in there they said yahuwah can't he doesn't see us we're doing this he doesn't he doesn't know we're doing this they think they're getting away with it um and so there's there's something about you know the fact that it happened in the temple and i would go back as well with the mark of the beast that a, you, there is idol worship all over the world and yahuwah hates idols uh, Yahushua he hates idols, obviously. They, they despise idols because he is not in the image of anything on earth. Um, but his wrath is not poured out necessarily on idol worshippers. It's always when it comes into people of the covenant. It seems to be focused on them. Like, you're in a covenant with me, you're in a marriage relationship with me, and you went and compromised you went in and were worshiping this other god. You know, you were in a adulterous relationship. I'm getting rid of you. Um, and um, so that's why, I'm again, I just want to uh, really 
put a focus here on that I think that in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple there was a repeated event where he's like that's it I'm done with you guys it's over I'm not never doing this again uh, at least in this you know section of land so 